evening and welcome to the Oshkosh Area School District regular board meeting for August 8th, 2018. Are we in compliance with the open meeting law? We are. And would you please call the roll? Carlin? Here. Eliza? Evans? Here. Turner? Here. Herzog? Here. Olmstead? Here. Peschel? We have a quorum. Thank you. You're welcome. Next, uh, we will have the Pledge of Allegiance. This, this evening, we have the privilege of having four high school students joining us. And so we'll let them come forward and then we'll introduce them afterward. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll invite the four high school students to uh, pull up a fourth chair <laughs> there. Um, we often hear about the notion that it takes a village to educate children. Well, thanks again to all of you and best wishes to you for your next year in the high school. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your summer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I had the, the privilege of attending a couple of the sessions of Badger Girl States and looking out over that sea of approximately 700 uh, students just was so inspiring and recognizing that this is the leadership of our state. And so my conclusion was we're in good hands and then having these four young people from Oshkosh, it just brings that uh, home in a, in a slightly different way. Um, moving on, then we have the board president's report. I had the uh, privilege today of attending a session at UW Oshkosh called Mind, Heart, and Teaching Symposium, which was put on by oh, yeah. uh, the College of Education and Human Services, uh, focusing on uh, mental health issues, trauma-informed care, uh, and I brought back some materials which I will pass on to Mr. Kemmer. Um, it gave me another perspective in terms of looking at suspensions and expulsions um, and how we we might look at uh, those students a little bit differently in terms of how did they get to that point when they they come before us and and what might we do differently or better in order to reach them um, I think I, I knew that before but th there were some really powerful statements uh, shared today by um, Mike Alta Cruz who is a mental health coordinator with the Nina School District mm -hmm. and then with Dr. Marguerite Phoenix Parks and Dr. Kyle Steele talking about classroom bias and prejudice. Um, just very informative sessions. So with that, I'll turn it over to the superintendent for the superintendent's report. Good news report, calendar, so on. Thank you. So today, we're going to go ahead and start off with a very nice story. Um, it's congratulations to 16 Oshkosh Area School District students who completed a youth apprenticeship during the 2017-2018 uh, school year. The Wisconsin's Youth Apprenticeship Program is part of a statewide school-to-work initiative designed for high school juniors and seniors who want hands-on experience in an occupational area at a work site along with classroom instruction. This past year, our students gained experience in engineering, manufacturing, information technology, finance, and healthcare. On our next slide, this was an event that occurred just this past weekend. <coughs> Congratulations to a generous group of students from Oakwood Elementary School. These elementary students raised over $1,000 during their lemonade and bake sale, and it was occurred this past Sunday. All of the money raised will be donated to the day-by-day -day warming shelter in Oshkosh. It was the second annual event, and these incredible students came up with the idea themselves as a way to help the homeless in our community. Congratulations and great job to these thoughtful and caring students. The Oshkosh Area School District's Project Search Program recently held its annual kickoff picnic for program participants. This year, 11 OASD student interns will participate in the program and will embark on a year of hands-on learning and professional development. Project Search is a business-led 
collaboration that enables young adults with disabilities to gain and maintain employment through trainer and career exploration. The program is a collaboration between OASD and Mercy Medical Center, as well as many other community partners. Oshkosh Area School District Administrators recently gathered for the 2018 Administrator Academy. These talented school, years, school leaders came together for two days of meaningful discussions and professional development. Topics of conversations included, and I think you all like this, Dr. Herzog, <laughs> literacy and cultural responsiveness, like mental health, human trafficking awareness and resources, as well as emergency preparedness specifically related to school safety. <clears throat> Speaking of school safety, members of the Oshkosh Area School District Executive Leadership Team recently joined Chief Dean Smith of the Oshkosh Police Department at the Wisconsin Police Chiefs Summers Training Conference this week. The conference provided both law enforcement and school district officials with the training needed to help better protect schools through crisis prevention, response, and recovery. School safety is of the utmost importance in Oshkosh area school districts, and we are so grateful for our strong partnerships with all of our local law enforcement agencies. The OASD was recently awarded a $75,000 mental health grant from DPI. The funding will be used to expand the Rise Up program through an, in an innovative site-based initiative at Merrill Middle, Merrill Elementary, Carl Traeger Middle and Carl Traeger Elementary. We were also awarded a $48,000 transition readiness grant from the Department of Public Instruction. The funding will be used to expand the services offered to youth with disabilities in the area of employment skills. We are so grateful for the partnerships that we have with organizations here in Oshkosh. And I'd like to take a moment to highlight two upcoming opportunities, the volunteer, that benefit our students and our school communities. On Thursday, August 16th, the United Way will host the annual Oshkosh Community Back to School Fair. This event takes place at Oshkosh North High School and helps over 1,000 students prepare for school. If you are interested in volunteering or donating supplies, please visit the United Way website. The ARC Gus Macker 3-on-3 three -three Basketball Tournament is happening August 18th and 19th. This year, all the money raised during this event will be no donated to the Oshkosh Area School District to help cover the cost of reduced price lunches for individual students for the 2018-19 school year. If you're interested in volunteering, contact information can be found on this slide. This is to serve as a reminder because it's this week. Mm -hmm. Online registration for the 2018-19 school year will begin this Friday, August 10th at 8 a.m. Our district families can find additional information on our website by clicking on the Registration and Enrollment Forms Quick link. This information was also mailed out and can be found in your Infinite Campus Parent Portal account. The online registration window will remain open from August 10th until August 20th. So you've got a very narrow window in there, so please make sure you get on this quickly. If you have any questions, please reach out to your child's school. We're looking forward to working with you and your family this school year. We are all committed to building community through education. And as superintendent, I'm committed to being present and engaged in our schools and throughout Oshkosh. So as you can see listed up here are just a few examples of where I've been spending my time. One-on-one -on -one orientation discussions with our principals are ongoing. Uh, rotary meetings, the EAA uh, Eagles Dinner and volunteer activities, WASDA First Year Superintendents Academy, breakfast with the Oshkosh Chamber leaders, as well as CESA 6 ensuring great leadership conference. I'm very proud of the work for our faculty here and for our administrative staff. They've been working very diligently um, and have allowed me to be able to meet with these individuals while I have the confidence and faith that the work that needs to get done is being done behind the scenes as well. So I want to make sure I publicly acknowledge my staff for that uh, because they've been working very diligently. And with that, I turn it back over to you, Dr. Herzog. Thank you very much, Dr. Cartwright. Are there any district administrator supplemental reports tonight? 
Seeing none, are there any committee reports tonight? I have one. Okay. Um, facility and Finance Committee met um, July 19th. That was a while ago. Seems like a long time ago. I know. <laughs> it feels like it was like I have a report. When did we do that? <laughs> um, first thing we discussed that morning was um, Dr. Grinlaw, um, Gunlock presented a one-page synopsis <laughs> to the committee regarding the security project. Um, a large portion of the safety grant will be used to enhance security practices and procedures throughout the district. The grant funds will also um, allow installation of Priority 2 cameras, which includes the second floor of um, school sites. Prior to the grant funds, there were not sufficient funds for Priority 2 and Priority 3 cameras. We had just done Priority 1 last year. Um, priority 3, and now Priority 3 cameras will be handed on an a la carte basis um, if it's needed. The, the staff on site will tell us if we need pockets of them and add them. Um, at the January 11, 2017 board meeting, the school board approved the selection for CEC for the initial project, and Dr. Gunlaw asked us permission to treat the additional work as a continuation of the existing project. It was all under that same um, selection for CEC. Um, he gave seven ra uh, rational points as to why continuing with CEC would be the best decision for the district, and the committee recommended proceeding as he requested. Dr. Gunlock also stated that there are some districts and private entities that did not apply for round one of the safety grant. Therefore, the window is being reopened to allow those districts to apply under the same criteria. Once that occurs, there will be a lot of money remaining, which will allow Oshkosh Area School District to amend the proposal and be able to apply for additional funds. Dr. Gunlock indicated that some of the criteria of the grant will be loosened up on the second round. It was noted that safety grant funds cannot be used to replace things that are already existing. They have to be new. Um, training would be an option for the additional funds as well as the possibility of adding storage space due to the increase of all the new cameras too. Um, then um, Sue Schnorr presented a recap for their health insurance bid. Um, an 8% increase for health insurance was budgeted. However, the current provider renewed at a 13% increase. Oh, wow. oh. Which is $1.2 million above what was anticipated. Okay. Selecting an alternative provider, Network Health, would save the district $4.3 million over what was budgeted for health care in a calendar year. The proposal also has a 7.5% rate guarantee for the second year. Approximately 60% of our participants would need to change providers. This plan would be implemented January 1 of 2019. If this plan were to be chosen, it was proposed to give employees the remaining portion, um, the remaining portion to get them full to the CPI increase then yeah. with the savings. There were concerns about the mental health services being disrupted by the carrier switch. Messaging is going to be critical in helping the staff understand their benefit packages. It was recommended that every employee be sent their total package, salary plus total benefit package. So employees start hearing those numbers more and have a greater appreciation and understanding of their total benefit package, mm -hmm. not just their income. The committee recommended bringing this to the board for a workshop. Someone from Network Health will be at the workshop to answer any of our questions and administration was directed to communicate to employee groups that a workshop will be held on the topic. Um, future agenda topics is uh, capital improvement updates, um, summer projects. Jim will come in and talk about this, about those. And our next meeting is August 20th, which is a change from our normal date because of um, people being on vacation. So it's August 20th at 8.30 a.m. Thank you very much. This is almost dead. Sure. Any other committee reports? Yes. May I make just a slight clarification, if that's okay? Absolutely. Uh, we're on the statement where we're saying that the, it would, the impact would be with 60% of our staff having to change providers. Participants. Uh, participants. Um, it's within that 60% also includes individuals who have never selected a provider to begin with. Oh, okay. Um, so it's a combination of both of those. And thank you for allowing me to sure. give a clarification oh, on that. That's helpful. Oh, okay. Okay, good to know. That's good to know. Thank you, Dr. Curry. Okay, moving on then. The next item on our agenda is the non-agenda related public forum. Is there anyone who wanted to speak to the board on any non-agenda item this evening? 
Then the next agenda item is the agenda-related public forum. Is there anyone who wanted to address the board on an agenda-related item? Seeing none, we will move into our workshop session. We have two workshops this evening. The first one is on dyslexia and will be led by uh, Dr. Kim Brown and uh, Ms. Julie Conrad. And then following the dyslexia report, we have a workshop uh, which is the annual at-risk update led by uh, Dr. Matt Kimmer. Ladies. So good evening. Um, I'm Julie Conrad, the Director of Curriculum and Assessment. And I'm Kim Brown, Director of Learning. All right, so this evening we're here to talk to you more about um, piloting of two different um, programs in two different areas of our um, literacy program here in the Oshkosh Area School District. And, and to start us off, we, we really want to, to say to our community, and you've heard me say this before, that children are more than just numbers, and that we really look to um, find the individual gifts, the strengths, et cetera, in the individual child, and that each child, we look at them as individuals and their needs and their needs for support. And um, some of our children have dyslexia in the Oshkosh Area School District, and we need to address that. And so tonight we are going to talk about about that and how we are working towards finding solutions for that. Okay. And so we're going to just start out with what the OESD has for a definition of dyslexia, and it's right up here. Dyslexia presents in many different ways. For many students who have the medical diagnosis of dyslexia, it can cause a pattern of learning difficulties. Those difficulties may include problems with accurate or fluent word recognition, poor decoding, and poor spelling abilities. And so um, you've heard me talk about, or you've heard both of us talk about our response to intervention before. So we're kind of summing up some of the pieces and what we're adding to it. So intervention is already a part of our response to intervention process. When a child is not responding to a reading strategy, additional supports are utilized by the classroom teacher in a typical room. We also have students who need support beyond the classroom and they're given more specific interventions by either the literacy teacher or the classroom teacher in conjunction with the literacy teacher. And the piece that we're adding to the RTI process would be a specific program created specifically for students with dyslexia and that would begin this current school year, 2018-2019. So we did take a look at several dyslexia programs and you can see the ones um, that we did take a look at. And our focus was really to find a program that would meet the needs of our learners with dyslexia. We also wanted a program that we could look at for um, elementary, middle, and high school. And so that's um, part of what we did. Um, you will, there we go. Um, the, the one that we would like to field test is the Sande system. It's an Orton-Gillingham based program. Um, we looked at lots of different, um, different school districts and what they're already utilizing. Um, the one that uh, made a big impact was Madison Area School District. They are using the Sande system and uh, they said that systemically it's working well in their district and that they're seeing some really um, good results with that. And so with the Sande system, there's two pieces. The Sande system one, that offers a structured, systematic, multi-sensory reading intervention for beginning readers through the end of second grade reading level. And then each lesson um, uses the Orton-Gillingham methods to provide effective intervention for small group. Sunday System 2 does the same thing. It offers the structure, structured, systematic, uh, multi-sensory reading. Um, and this is for our students who are intermediate re readers within a third grade reading level through eighth grade reading level. Um, and so um, as, you, as we looked deeper into this as well, another piece that um, was just really nice is that it has a placement test. And the placement test um, places the student in an appropriate level of where they should begin. Um, some of the systems, um, you began at the very beginning no matter what age or grade level you are in. So I, I liked that we were accounting for what the child might know already to figure out where to begin. So. so within this, you're going to notice that we use the term field test. Um, in the Oshkosh Area School District, when we are looking at just one 
program and seeing how it works for our students or within the system. We call it a field test because we're, we're doing it um, out with everybody. We call, um, we call it a pilot when we have two or more programs that we're comparing against each other. And so as we go in with dyslexia, because we are looking at Sunday for the Oshkosh-Sharia School District for the 2018-19 school year, we're going to be calling it a field test. So, so you know the difference as we're talking about that. Well, whether it's a field test or a pilot, we always want to have performance indicators to make a decision on, is this working for our students or is it not working for our students? And when we're doing that, we are going to be looking at the following pieces um, to determine how well it's working for our children and if we're making progress. With students um, that are in an intervention, we want them to be making more than one year's worth of growth. And so how, how because we, we're trying to close the gap or we're trying to you know backfill for a student to make sure that they um, are getting what they need. So when we're doing that, there's gonna be different ways that we want to measure it. So first off, we're gonna be looking at the mastery checks within that field test intervention program, or sometimes we call them curriculum-based checks because you're looking at the assessments that are designed to be specifically with that program that matches up to show how they're making progress through the system, so that's one. The other piece is that we want to know how that child is doing compared to their peers or where we would expect them to be at a grade level. So we are going to be using the developmental reading assessment which is used um, K through 5 in the Oshkosh Area School District and Fontas and Pinnell for our middle and, and our high school um, students because that's the reading assessment to determine grade level and progress for those two um, either primary or secondary students. Then we would also use PALS. PALS is our selected um, literacy screen, early literacy screener, or phonemic awareness screener um, for grades K, 1, and 2. And so we're going to be using that. And once again, we can compare how a student is making progress because that is standardized. And then the last piece is progress monitoring assessments. We are going to be working with our school psychologists because whenever we have a student that is in our RTI, our response to intervention continuum, um, we want to make sure that our assessments are lined up and that we also have something that's outside of what we normally do to do that, that um, triangulation or that check to make sure that we are getting valid results. Then action steps and logistics for the field test. Um, when we do um, when we do a field test or we do a pilot, um, we start first by working with our principals and our instructional support teachers. Um, we're also working with our special education teachers because we want to identify schools, educators, and students that are going to be participating in the field test. Um, we are getting ready to do that part, so we can't tell you how many schools, etc. But that information will be coming. We'll order the materials based on that. We already have our professional development schedule for September 6th and September 7th. Then from there, we are going to arrange data collection process. We're going to first start with baselines. What do those baselines look like? Um, we'll be working with our um, instructional support teachers along with our principals and classroom teachers to figure out a way that we're going to monitor data. Are we going to do it directly through EduClimber, which is our data warehouse system, or are we going to do this in some other tracking way, along with checkpoints, winter and spring benchmarks then set up the evaluation process, and we want quantitative, which are the numbers, and I've been talking a lot about the numbers, but we also want qualitative evidence collected in there. So how is the student responding? Um, what is the student's mindset as they're going through that program? Um, what, is the, what is the teacher seeing? So there's other pieces besides this that, um, that is going to be in there besides just the numbers. Then we're going to be creating a communication plan for stakeholders, including family families. This is the first step in our communication. Follow-up professional development and supports for our pilot educators because we know that, actually in this case, our field test educators because we know that they're going to need, they're going to have questions. Ongoing support is going to be needed. Um, we're going to start monitoring and implementing those KPIs analyze the data to determine results, and then we're going to come back and provide the results with a recommendation to either adopt this as an intervention program for students with dyslexia, or if we're not seeing those results, then we're going to try something else. So with that and the conversations that we have been having about our, our literacy program and, and 
we've been talking about literacy. I feel like Kim and I, um, <laughs> being curriculum instruction assessment, we, we live and breathe literacy, but we feel the urgency. Our educators feel the urgency when we did our Administrator Academy um, this the Monday and Tuesday. We could really feel the urgency because we know this is a foundational key within our district and foundational for our students. So in addition to looking at reading interventions for um, students with dyslexia, we're also going to do some core reading instruction revisions. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know that in May of 2017, the board adopted our reading curriculum. And in that, there was a lot of different resources, but there was one that does teach phonics instruction. Um, we also realized that that is a very old adoption, so 1997. So um, we do definitely want to take a look at phonic programs. So one of the pieces that we are looking at is to meet the evidence recommendations in the U.S. Department of Education Institute of Education Sciences. They talk about foundational skills programs should include the following elements. And here are the four different elements. To teach students the academic language skills, including the use of inferential and narrative language and vocabulary knowledge, Develop awareness of the segments of sounds and speech and how they link to letters. Teach students to decode words, analyze word parts, and write and recognize words. And ensure that each student reads connected text every day to support reading accuracy, fluency, and comprehension. So those are the four recommendations. Um, we looked at the following phonic programs. And we had teachers and literacy teachers come in after school to preview these materials to kind of figure, like just to hear from them on um, what programs spoke to them. Um, and then we also looked at those four guidelines on each of the programs. Um, it, it worked out well because the teachers and reading teachers um, all wanted to look at phonics, uh, Fondas and Pinnell, and they also wanted to look at the Calkins units of study. Um, the good news is both of these met all four of the, um, the pieces that I just <laughs> all four um, of these elements. And so um, we're going to be taking a deeper look at that. In fact, there's a group coming together next week to start exploring and uh, to start discussing what that pilot might look like. And so speaking of that pilot, here are the action steps and logistics that they're going to be discussing next week to get us started. Um, first off, we're going to work with principals to identify the schools, grade levels, classrooms, and teachers to participate in the pilot. So a whole entire classroom, and actually we are going to require that, for example, at a school, if, if kindergarten wants to pilot and there are two kindergarten classrooms, both kindergarten classrooms would participate in the pilot. That way when the students move to first grade, we know exactly what um, what curriculum they had and that has we've done that every time that we have pilot anything piloted anything and done um, two programs or done comparisons that we want both classrooms whether it's two three etc to be able to to have both be piloted and the teacher then also has a partner or a team in, um, in order to support each other through that pilot implementation we're going to then order the materials based on that um, we are going to set up professional development because we haven't identified the schools and we want to make sure that we have educators that are that want to do this that are willing to do this they would because this is it's a challenge when you take on a, on a pilot program we have wonderful educators um, for example last year we had 73 classroom teachers um, pilot our mystery science and so um, th that's that seems like a lot but we have over how many? 300 mm -hmm. um, elementary teachers. So we want to make sure that we have enough materials and that we have the support in place for the professional development. Once again, we'll set up that data collection process. So we'll set up a very prescribed, what baseline are we going to do, the checkpoints, um, the winter, spring um, benchmarks along in those. And then we'll set up the quantitative and qualitative evidence collection. We usually do surveys. Um, with our classroom teachers and then we'll also um, get observation evidence for from our students and we want to compare it to how is it going with our current OESD program so we'll use the same um, instrument so we're really doing that pilot we will be doing a study we will do a communication plan so just like we did with mystery science and uh, three year, now going on three years ago for bridges we'll communicate with families that they're in a pilot classroom We'll do the ongoing professional development. We'll monitor those key performance 
indicators. Then we are going to we do a protocol with our key stakeholders, um, especially our teachers that have been piloting in the classroom, and we'll also develop um, how we're going to communicate and get feedback from families and then feedback from students, etc. And we will do a protocol to determine the results of the pilot. Um, that it, that worked really well when we did our Bridges pilot. Our Bridges pilot, we remember we had compared three different um, math programs, so we'll do a protocol with that, and then we'll bring forward an adoption recommendation. Um, based on those pilot results and you can see that um, in late spring I would anticipate more in the May time frame because we're wanted, we would want to get um, data all the way through the end of the school year. And so what we would be looking at is um, PALS quick checks in K through one. And notice we're choosing K through one in this because for the um, Calkins units of study in phonics, Kindergarten and first grade is ready right now. Second grade won't be ready until the fall of 2019, because we're in 2008. I had to think, where, what year are we in right now? Um, once again, we'll also be using the developmental reading assessment and um, Fontes and Pinnell as appropriate, because those are our current um, assessments to compare where they are in grade level. And then we are also looking at additional, once again, that third, so that we can triangulate a progress monitoring assessment that's independent of what we currently have in the Oshkosh Area School District so that we can determine do we have valid and reliable results. If I may, Board, I just want to re truly recognize the work of both of these ladies uh, because it was in a very compressed time period for which we did a lot of research and had a lot of meaningful conversations. Um, in addition, when I was not available to have a lot of those conversations, um, Dr. Gunlock also helped facilitate some of the conversations and some of the detailed pieces that were necessary um, in order to ensure that we would be able to bring this forward to you um, tonight just as a workshop and also to ensure that from our community they understand that we are listening um, and that we are going to be responsive um, to the needs of our children because that's what it's about for us is ensuring that we are being responsive to the needs of our children. We recognize that students who have that medical diagnosis of dyslexia present themselves differently in an educational environment. There are many of those students who do not need, um, a, a, you know, they could be 80% of them approximately that don't need additional support within the classroom or they may need just a little bit of an uh, additional support with a reading interventionist coming in and supporting the teacher or working with the student directly. However, we also know that there are um, some of those students who have that medical diagnosis who do need specialized instruction so that their needs are a little bit more intense. And so those are students for which we would proceed through our response to intervention procedures in order to look for um, a special education evaluation for those students in order to provide specialized instruction. This pilot is to capture those students who are kind of in between those mm -hmm. two areas. Mm -hmm. Um, and it is really working towards a program that is research based and as you already heard tonight is currently being used in another large district in Madison and where they are experiencing success. Um, so I feel very comfortable in bringing this forward to our community as well as to the board and saying this is how we are going to attempt to address this concern. Um, for our students in order to help them, in order to provide the proper supports to ensure their success in the long term. Um, it has a lot of the things that you would want to look for, especially with like the explicit reading type of, uh, or explicit teaching um, that is required of students who have dyslexia. Um, the placement test is a, is a critical piece of that because again, it allows us to, to take where the student is currently functioning and proceed forward rather than making automatic assumptions uh, which many of the other research-based programs out there unfortunately do. Um, and again, this being something where we are targeting all schools, and because we are targeting all schools, this means that for that gap population I was talking about, they will have the opportunity to participate in this program. Um, and the beauty of this is that our teachers are receiving training. Um, our, our administrators are learning about this as well and in the future we will also um, come back to the school board in order to provide a work session with the school board to discuss more thoroughly about um, what dyslexia is and of course my executive team attends our workshop so they will be um, able to 
obtain that information at the same time, but please be rest assured, we've had some very explicit conversations in our administrative um, team meetings uh, and talking about dyslexia and what it means so that but that way they we are learning as well and so we just wanted to make sure that uh, the board was aware of that and at this point in time any questions that the board members may have well I would just like to say thank you dr. Cartwright for taking on this issue and really um, showing some leadership and moving forward and I think that this is a great step for um, our district and thank you and Julie and Kim, I cannot thank you enough for your constant attention on this issue, and I appreciate it. And I believe we'll be discussing this a little bit in more detail mm -hmm. tomorrow during the education committee meeting at 8.30 in this room. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for all your hard work. I really appreciate mm -hmm. everything you've done. That was good. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Good job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, you know, You've only been on the, the job here officially for about six weeks and to uh, bring this district to this point um, as we're on the start of a new school year so that children who have been diagnosed with di with dyslexia can have their needs addressed is is commendable and I know that you didn't do that on your own you no. have a mm -hmm. wonderful supporting cast here yes. in Julie and Kim and others and uh, so again I really grateful um, mm -hmm. about this topic tonight. Over the last three years, this is probably the number one topic that I've interacted with community members on throughout the district. Mm -hmm. Parents, a grandparent of a student, um, a couple of professors at UW Oshkosh, because I don't know a lot about dyslexia, but I was hearing a lot about it, and to try to educate myself better, I felt I needed to reach out to various people to help me on my own journey. And um, I just think it's so critical that we address the needs of this special uh, population. There are other resources in the community, I know, that stand ready to help us. And I know Dr. Cartwright has reached out to UW Oshkosh to continue to build on the good relationships and uh, collaborations we've had with staff there. Dr. Stacy Sconing, who chairs the special mm -hmm. education department, uh, emailed me today and said, if there's anything I can do to help on this, uh, let her know. Dr. Bill Kitts, who is the, um, I believe he's the co-director, co-coordinator of Project Success, which is a special program at UW Oshkosh to address the needs of dyslexic students, um, I, has also said he will be happy to share anything with us. I, I shared with all of the board members and I think with the two of you and, mm -hmm. and Dr. Cartwright a document he sent Mm -hmm. out which represents um, mm -hmm. a document from the uh, California Department of Public Instruction copyrighted in 2016 2017 I'm sorry uh, that looks at dyslexic guidelines in terms of how to, to meet the needs of these special special students so I know there are resources out there I was also approached by a school psychologist who said please mm -hmm. include the school psychologists in these conversations yeah. because they bring us a different perspective perhaps mm -hmm. than a classroom teacher or a principal mm -hmm. or a reading teacher and we really need those mm -hmm. people to, to help us figure out how to best meet the needs of, of these students so I'm just so happy that mm -hmm. we are at this point today that we are moving forward and addressing concerns and needs that have been brought to us over a period of time and we actually have a plan to move forward and so I thank everyone who's been involved in, in bringing us to this point today. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Okay, moving on then, Dr. Matt Kemmer is going to give us the annual at-risk update. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. All right, so as Dr. Herzog mentioned, I'm here today to give you the, the update for our uh, PK through 12 supportive and alternative education plan. Uh, this plan was created originally back in 2014 as a way to provide an overview of the different ways that we meet the needs of students who may be struggling in school and are at risk of not graduating. So um, with that, every year we're required to review the plan and uh, identify how we um, 
develop the criteria for considering whether or not a student is identified at risk. We also have to uh, update the different ways that we meet the, the needs of students who are at risk. So uh, the, the plan itself is, is quite lengthy. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Brown to uh, click on the link here. Just to get a visual of what the plan looks like, it's 16 pages long, and I'm not going to go through page by page because um, we may be here all night, but I just want to touch on a few key points or, or changes that the committee decided to make uh, for this year compared to last year. So um, you can click back on uh, yep. the slides here. So before we get into that, uh, our committee met up back in March, and it the committee for this past year consisted of the following individuals and as you can see uh, we have quite a few principals on the list uh, from all three levels we have alternative education teachers and coordinators and also pupil service staff members so the plan consists of these 10 sections so uh, we have an introduction philosophy goals and objectives applicable laws and statutes identification which is how we identify our students as at risk uh, notifications or how we notify parents, um, program services, how we monitor the progress of our students, program evaluation, and then the related policies. And our goals and objectives have really uh, remained unchanged from last year, and they're really focused around our district's mission of building community through education. More specifically, our objectives, as you can see, focus on graduation rates. Uh, we take a close look at the opportunities that we have for the students uh, in our schools in terms of the interventions and the career and academic planning. Uh, we really want to focus on providing early intervention for our students and then we want to make sure both parents and students have a say in what their education looks like. So in terms of how we identify students uh, as being at risk, uh, the state allows districts to decide how they make that identification. However, we still have to follow the, the state requirements within that. So the state has requirements for criteria for grades 5 through 12. In grades PK through 4, we really make that determination on our own. And, and the things we focus on are attendance, behavior, uh, and then academics. And we use our response intervention and our PBIS process to mainly drive those areas. For grades 5 through 8, we look at the following criteria. So a student has to have two or more of the following. Uh, they have to be um, considered a habitual truant, uh, two or more years behind their age group and basic skills, uh, if they're a teen <coughs> parent or pregnant, uh, adjudicated delinquent, or if it's an eighth grade individual who scores um, below the basic level in each area on the state exam, or an eighth grade student who failed to be promoted to ninth grade. The criteria for students in grade nine through 12 is exactly the same. The only additional piece is that uh, it includes students who are one or more years behind uh, their, their age group in terms of credits attained. So in terms of the, the changes from this year uh, compared to last year, there really weren't many. One of the things that we did is we went back and took a closer look at the assessments that we're using to monitor progress. And we made a few changes just to make sure that uh, they reflect what we're currently using as a district. And the other change that we made is we added to our program matrix. So these are some of the new programs that, that kind of came on board over the course of the last year or so. Uh, the first is our Rise Up program, which is the framework that we use to meet the, the mental health needs of students within our district. Uh, the, the second is Project Phoenix, which is a school within a school program at Oshkosh North High School. And uh, the, the idea behind that program is it, it's to help students transition into high school and uh, they kept that program at about 30 students. And then finally, we have Resiliency and Structured Education, or RISE program at Carl Traeger Middle School, uh, which is a program, a special education program specifically for de designed for students who have autism spectrum disorder. So along with these changes, we, we had some pretty in-depth conversations about needs that we have in the district related to alternative education. So I'm just gonna to touch on a few of the, the key points from the conversations that we had. So the first conversation really revolved around our New START program, which is uh, considered a GED2 program. Uh, the GED is a you know, uh, equivalency test that a lot of students take uh, in lieu of uh, high school diploma 
for our program with New Start, students show proficiency on the GED two, on the GED test, but they still earn a diploma from whichever high school they're enrolled at. So it's really a nice option for a lot of our students who are credit deficient. So some of the criteria for the program, the student has to be at least 17 years old. They have to be at least three credits behind uh, the, the class that they entered ninth grade with. And there are a number of other criteria that they, they have to uh, align with in order to be enrolled in the program. Uh, New Start caps at 15 students. And the program has been at Oshkosh North High School for the last few years. Um, with that, uh, the program has been dominated by Oshkosh North <coughs> students up until this past year. Um, that, that trend kind of reversed this past year for a number of reasons, um, but we had significantly more West students this year. In the past, I got a lot of feedback that some of our West students have been reluctant to attend New Start because of its location at North High School. So uh, we have had conversations for the past couple of years about the possibility of creating a West New Start program. Uh, one of the nice things about New Start is it, it is only three hours long, so you could easily have a morning program and an afternoon program, which would be ideal for our students, uh, depending on what their schedule looks like. But we just never had the data to support the expansion of the program before. However, uh, looking forward, going into next year, it looks like we're already going to be at capacity at that, that, that 15 uh, enrollment cap number at the start of the year. So um, as we go on throughout the course of this year and we start to look at our projections for next year, it might be something that we want to consider. One of the other benefits of New Start, as you all know, our Riverside is a very popular alternative education program. And uh, one of the benefits of expanding New Start may be to relieve some of the, the stress on the Riverside program in terms of the waiting list because it's just another option for students. <coughs> one of the other areas we discussed related to alternative education was programming for middle school students. Uh, we recognize that this is an area of need. It has been for a number of years now. And uh, one of the thoughts was, you know, our Empower program at West High School has been very successful over the first two years of implementation. Project Phoenix uh, was very successful this past year. And the, the question was, could we potentially mirror those programs at the middle school level, uh, which is an excellent thought. Um, one of the hangups with that, though, is you know, both Empower and Project Phoenix were created by um, kind of reallocating the staff within the buildings at the high school level. And because the, the number of staff members at the middle school level are, are, are far less, you know, we wouldn't be able to do that at all five of our middle schools. So we discussed the possibility of maybe um, combining resources and creating maybe two old middle school, school within the school programs, one on the north side <coughs> and one on the west side. Um, but that has some drawbacks as well uh, in that you're transporting students away from their home school. Along with that, um, you know, you're, you're taking our students uh, many of who are the, the neediest students in our schools, and you're putting them in one place. So uh, you're definitely going to have um, the need for more resources in whichever school those programs are located at. So that would be an additional expense. Along with that, there's a lot of focus now on school report cards and school data, and that, that's definitely going to skew school data. You know, if, if we have a lot of our neediest students in one building, um, so there, there are going to be some, some ramifications of, of that as well. So it's something we're going to continue to take a look at, but we definitely know that the need is there for our middle school students. Uh, another potential need down the road is for our Empower Academy students. As you know, Empower has been in place for two years, and it has been very successful at West High School. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we're excited to see this year is how our Empower students transition out of that program. So it's only for students in ninth and 10th grade. The idea was we have a lot of options for students who are juniors and seniors. However, the Empower program is, is unique in that it's a school within a school program. It's very structured. You have the same cohort going from year to year. For a lot of students, they may experience challenges coming out of that. So this will be the first year where we're going to be able to gather data on students who have gone through the program, both as freshmen and sophomores, and see how uh, they adjust to transitioning out of Empower. And you know, if, if we're experiencing that, uh, if we're seeing that a lot of students are experiencing trouble with that transition out, we may want to take a closer look at 
expanding a power or um, what other options we might have with making that transition a bit easier. In terms of program updates, we made some adjustments in terms of uh, the, the teaching staff for our Jackson Street program. Our Jackson Street program is a program for students who are incarcerated at, uh, it's located at the, the Winnebago County Sheriff's Department. The number of students who are enrolled in the Jackson Street program fluctuates throughout the year. However, this past year, um, it, it seemed like the needs at, at that location were more than in years past, especially toward the end of the year. The teacher that we had serving Jackson Street is also one of our, our part-time second chance teachers. So there wasn't a whole lot of flexibility in, turn, in his schedule, uh, and, and the needs at second chance are significant as well. Um, so it, was, it ended up being a, a challenge toward the end of the year to really meet the needs of all of our students at Jackson Street. So we made an adjustment going into this year where we paired the, the Jackson Street jail position with our half-time New Start position. Given that New Start only runs for three hours during the day, that provides a little bit more flexibility for that teacher a little more time to get out to Jackson Street and then they can flex their schedule a little bit easier. Along with that, um, we are gonna have someone who's serving as a coordinator for a lot of our alter alternative programs located on the north side. So that would include New Start, Project Phoenix, Jackson Street, and our Crossroads program. And that's just gonna help support the teacher and the students within those programs. Um, we talked a lot about uh, behavioral supports that are needed at the elementary level and, and as you know uh, we are in the process of creating a plan that includes the addition of three behavioral interventionists to support the behavioral needs at the elementary level. Uh, excuse me I have a oh. question on that elementary one. Sure. Um, I thought we had approved 2.8 FTE which could be used to hire an additional counselor or a social worker or a dean of students or is that something different? The, the, the 2.8 FTE were allocated toward uh, behavioral interventionists or behavioral intervention uh, consultants. So that was determined to, uh, the reason we decided on behavior interventionists is because um, it's a position that would, would um, impact all of our elementary schools. If, if, whereas if we hired a counselor or a dean of students, they're usually placed at one, two at the very most. Mm -hmm. This way we could kind of uh, put our behavior interventionists in pods and really those are the individuals that can focus more of their time on doing prevention, uh, intervention and supporting teachers when they're in the moment in terms of building a relationship with student, students and handling the behaviors in the classroom. Okay, that isn't what I understood <laughs> yet, but I, I understand that um, sometimes these positions are a bit fluid. If I may, Dr. Herzog, sure. um, one of the focus for these interventions as well is really um, having a different approach as far as professional development is concerned so that we have a much larger impact and really um, enable our teachers our, who are uh, working with these children on a daily basis to empower them to be able to have the tools that's necessary in order to arrange more of a positive um, environment and a positive and successful techniques and working with students in order to hopefully prevent the need for them having to go for um, going to a guidance counselors and such so for example written into the job description for these positions we have put in there that they will be coming in and creating um, professional development for which we are planning on rolling out online so teachers have access to it um, at, at any point in time uh, but one of the things specifically being, for example, um, nonverbal um, crisis prevention intervention um, de-escalation strategies. And so uh, these are strategies that are specifically designed so that when a teacher sees a child that is starting to escalate in behaviors, they know what are proper tools or strategies in, in order to intervene appropriately with that child knowing that that child may be coming from a trauma-based um, environment, knowing that that child may be coming from a poverty. So it's a combination and it's really trying to pull together a lot of this cutting edge strategies that the district has been utilizing, but trying to get it a little bit more seamless to avoid that child having to be sent out of the room or for administration or a counselor or someone to have to come into the room in order to remove the child. So this is a much more proactive approach 
um, and is empowering our staff and giving them the tools and resources necessary so that they can more appropriately respond or intervene ahead of time whenever a child is having some conduct difficulties um, or mental health disabilities so that way we can hopefully prevent a, a, a situation from escalating as you might say so that's just one example of um, a training that they're going to be working on in order to roll out district-wide um, in order to empower our, our teachers and paraprofessionals as well that sounds reasonable I would hope we would be able to gather data to demonstrate the efficacy of these positions absolutely yes ma'am we should be able to do that okay all right um, so that, that, that about wraps up the, the update. I did want to provide some additional information on the Crossroads program. Uh, the Crossroads program has been in place for two years now, since 2016. And uh, the program was initially created to help support students who have been expelled by the district. So what it does is it allows students to continue to earn credits during the term of their expulsion. And the goal is that when their term comes to an end, and they're uh, entering back into the regular school setting, they're in a position where they could be successful and, and still graduate, uh, hopefully with their um, with the, the class that they originally entered uh, high school with. So uh, for those that aren't aware, Crossroads uh, is located on Wagu Street, in downtown Oshkosh in our Second Chance building. It takes place after the Second Chance Day. We have two sessions, each run for about an hour and a half. Um, in terms of, of teaching staff, we have a program coordinator located at Crossroads. We also have a English teacher and a math teacher who support students in the program. So prior to Crossroads, we really didn't have a formalized program for students who had been expelled from the district. A lot of times uh, there was some online content that they received, but uh, for the most part we, we didn't see a lot of student success with just that online piece. And, and what we know about students who are at risk, uh, who are struggling with behaviors, relationships can make all the difference. And uh, when we thought about who would be the right fit for Crossroads, the individuals that we selected are, are great at building relationships. You know, they're, they're great teachers in general, but uh, one of their strengths is just, uh, you know, the, the way that they work with students. And for the most part, you know, students love being around the, the teachers who are there. That's one of the reasons that they continue to show up on a day-to-day -day basis. So really the, the program um, emphasizes the, the, the benefit of, of having that positive adult who's there for them. It's also somebody who can keep track of their programming and make sure that they're continuing to uh, stay on pace for meeting the, the terms of their expulsion order. Each student who enters Crossroads has uh, an individualized, individualized plan that's created that's uh, geared toward meeting their early reinstatement clause if they have one in their order or um, setting them up for success when that term, expulsion term, comes to an end. So in terms of the enrollment data that we've had at Crossroads, uh, since the program was created we've had 30 students enrolled in the program. Uh, 10 of those students will be back for the 18-19 school year. Seven students have been transitioned back to one of our high schools or one of our other alternative programs, and I'm glad to say that four of those students have graduated uh, back in June, and the three others are on pace to graduate at the end of this next school year. We've ended up having to, dis to dismiss nine students from the program, and, and, and the reason for that is typically either behaviors or the students just stop showing up. Uh, we've had three students transfer out of the Crossroads program and enroll in other districts. And then we've had one student who voluntarily withdrew from the program. In terms of credit summaries, um, for the Crossroads program, students are required to earn at least one credit per semester. The reason we settled on one credit is because we have an English teacher and a math teacher right on staff. So there's really no excuse for not earning a half a credit in both of those areas each semester. But in addition to the English and math, there's online content. So students can uh, participate in social studies and science classes online or even elective classes. So that part of it, they can really go at their own pace. 
So based on what we've seen, since the start of the program, students have earned more than one credit 24 different times in a semester. Um, along with that, students have earned two or more credits in a semester 16 different times. So keep in mind that uh, typically at the high school level, students are earning roughly about three credits per semester. So not too far off. We've actually had a student earn as many as four and a half credits in a semester. And the average number of credits that our Crossroads students have earned per semester is about 1.37. So um, one caveat to this, um, some of the credit data can be misleading in that sometimes we have students come into the program near the end of a semester. So the opportunity for them to earn really any credits is a bit challenging if they're coming in with only a few weeks left. Um, one of the other things to consider is that for a lot of our students who come into Crossroads, um, they're experiencing success for the first time. So in many instances, we have students who in the, the semester or two before entering Crossroads, uh, while attending school on a full-time basis, didn't earn any credits. And now they're in Crossroads and, and they're earning uh, one credit, one and a half credits. Um, so it's something to consider as well. Here's my contact information if you have any questions after this evening. So thank you, uh, Mr. Kramer. I appreciate the, uh, the attention to this information. And at this point in time, I'm going to turn it over uh, to, back to the board uh, for any comments or questions that you may have. Quick question, Matt. Sure. Um, when the students from Empower came and spoke to our board, they just left such a great impression, and I was so impressed. And I assumed it was a four-year program, but it's only a two-year program. I missed that. Correct. So when they transition to juniors and seniors, they just in go regular to regular population. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, some of them will enroll in, in all, our other alternative programs like Riverside. Okay. Um, <laughs> others uh, participate in the school to work options. Okay. So there are a number of possibilities for those students. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I think these programs illustrate that every child is different, every child is unique, and it's our job to make sure that we're educating all, and all means all. And so it's really important that we main maintain these programs and that we gather data so that we know um, how effective these are and if they need to be tweaked they can be uh, but having alternatives is is really critical for success of all students throughout the system so thank you to you and to those staff members who help prepare this report and who on a daily basis interact with these students to make sure that they too are successful in our school district thank you all right, thank you, Dr. Kemmer. Um, next on the agenda is the consent resolution agenda. For the consent resolution agenda, the board has been furnished with background material on each item or has discussed it at a previous meeting. These will be acted upon with one vote without discussion. If a board member wants to discuss any item, it will be pulled out of the consent agenda and will be voted on separately. The board will consider the approval of personnel A appointments, temporary appointments, resignations, and salary schedule. So we need a motion and a second. Second. <laughs> Please call the roll. Carolyn? Aye. Carolyn? Aye. Eliza? Evans? Aye. Evans? Aye. Garner? Aye. Garner? Aye. Herzog? Aye. Herzog? Aye. Olmsted? Aye. Olmsted? Aye. Kessel? The motion carried. Thank you. Do we have any individually considered resolutions tonight? And then uh, do we have any requests for future agenda items? Are there any announcements tonight? We, I would then entertain a motion to adjourn. So, so moved. moved. Oh, second. Oh. Whoa. Please, please call the roll. Down. Eliason, Evans? Aye. Evans, I, Garner? Aye. Garner, I, Herzog? Aye. Herzog, I, Austin? Aye. Austin, I, Herzog? Carolyn? Aye. Carolyn, I, motion carried. Thank you very much. This me